Handy. Good morning. Why, why are we the only ones standing? Joanne. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're not gonna sing today. We're gonna sing. Is that okay? Y'all want to sing a little bit? Okay. <clears throat> now remember, this is this is probably gonna be another. This is our practice. Okay. This is when we practice this week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your love is amazing. the other day we waited till the end and we introduced our right hand or our left hand we're going to introduce our left hand or our right hand today okay raise your left hand raise your right hand turn them together they just met now you go all right that's how you do
David, Dr. J. Thank you, Chad. Good morning. Isn't it great to know today that we're a people of hope and Amen. we have a hope in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who died for us on Calvary, who was raised on the se third day, excuse me, <laughs> so that he might be the first fruits of them that sleep. Amen. Therefore, if he was resurrected from the grave, you can be sure that when he comes back, we will be resurrected as well. And so you and I recognize that we believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the immediate return, but the imminent return. That means that he could come back at any time. And you and I need to be equipped. We need to be prepared. I would encourage you over the course of the next several days to just go to Matthew's Gospel and read that eschatological account, that passage in Matthew chapter 24 and chapter 25, where Jesus is laying out those things that must happen before, his before he comes back. And so what you're going to see when you read that is he could come back today. And you and I need to be equipped and prepared for that. That's why we've been looking at these passages of Scripture. He who has been given much, much will be required. Because we will be accountable for those things that we do in this life. I'm so glad you're here today. Um, we had a glorious um, celebration on our campus yesterday. We had over 100 cars on our property here. Uh, we had over $400 given by way of donation to us yesterday to go to missions. And so we have had a great weekend thus far. Amen. And we have started, yeah, amen. And we've started this Sunday morning in a great way, praising our Heavenly Father and praising the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. And so we're going to praise God within the context of our experience of worship this morning as well. I'm so glad you're here. So glad you made the choice to be with us here this morning. It's just a good day, isn't it? Amen. God's grace has already taken care of our needs this morning. He got us up out of our beds, even though we might have been a little tired because we stayed up a little later than normal. Certainly I did. Because I'm, I'm an early-to-bed guy and an early-to-rise guy as well. But I, I'm so grateful that you're here today and that we can worship God in spirit and in truth. I wonder this morning, before we have a prayer time, if there are those people on your heart this morning that you would like to make mention of that we might pray for here at the beginning of our service. All right, thank you, Chad. We'll certainly remember Karen in our praying this morning. Something else. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Miss Judy, your son and fiance. Something else. We certainly need to remember Brother Frankie's family in the midst of their grief and heartache. Something else. Let's pray together this morning. Father God, we bless you. We honor you and we praise you because you're worthy of all praise and glory this morning. Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for the grace of life and the grace of having the opportunity to live in this great nation called America, whereby we are able to worship as we see fit. And Father, we see fit to worship your way, to do it as your Bible directs us, to do it in a manner that is pleasing unto you, a manner that brings your kingdom's work into view, not only for us here in this place, but within the context of our community and our world as well. Father, we recognize that all around us 
there are people who have needs this morning. We thank you that you're the great needs meeting God. Amen. Father, I pray that we would live out that precious hope that we have within our hearts. It comes because we know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so today, Father, we choose to honor you. We choose to worship you. We pray today that you, in the power of your Holy Spirit, would tabernacle with us here in this place. And that all of us, those in this room, those who are participating with us by way of our internet feed, that all of us might have an encounter today with the Holy God. And that through that encounter, we might be changed so that we might change our world. We love you today. We thank you, Jesus, for going to Calvary's cross for us and in our place. Lead us through this time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Stand with us. Let's continue singing.
honestly say I don't know why I picked that song, but I do now because I was thinking, Brother Morgan, you can tell I really, my voice is about shot. This has been a long weekend. And this morning, whenever I got up, I was like, I'd already sent out the music to everybody, and I thought to myself, what, what am I doing? <laughs> there is, that is going to be a rough song to sing. You pray for me. <laughs> I mean, that's not glad. There was one time that it squeaked. I don't know if anybody else heard that, but I did. Kenny. <laughs> but then, as Dr. J was up here, you said everything that was in that song and you had no idea what we were going to sing and it's, it's, aren't you glad that he loves us the splendor of the king
Heavenly Father, we come to you to say thank you for allowing us to be here today. God, I pray that uh, the message that Dr. J brings would be straight from your heart, that we would leave here differently than when we came in. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 42. And I introduced to you last Sunday morning these five servant songs that are found in Isaiah's prophecy. So what we have is approximately 750 years before the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in five very specific passages in Isaiah. The first of which is Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. And we find the introduction to the servant in Isaiah chapter 42. Then we have a servant song found in chapter 49. And one in chapter 50 as well. And then chapter 52, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12, that glorious passage that talks about, by his stripes we have been healed, by that which he endured for us on Calvary's cross, we have been made whole. And then finally, the fifth of the servant songs to be found in the prophecy of Isaiah found in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. And you will be reminded that that fifth servant song is that glorious passage when Jesus was there in Capernaum, the hometown of the apostle Peter, there in the synagogue, that um, they asked him as a rabbi to speak. And he opened the scroll of Isaiah and found Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 3 and declared his ministry and his mission being fulfilled in their eyes there in that day. And so over the course of the last calendar week, I have been praying about whether or not God wanted us to continue here in this message, this group of messages on the servant songs, or there was something else because of the nature of this weekend that we needed to do something differently. So here's what I did. I listened to the Constitution of the United States two times completely, this week and then I read it with my own eyes and according to my own head as well during this week you would remember that uh, the Constitution was most probably written primarily by Thomas Jefferson and I will admit to you this morning that, that one of the, the greatest books I ever read in my life was Brody's book on the life of Thomas Jefferson, about 640 pages. And I read it in 1975, and it still has an effect on my life in these days. And because this first servant song deals with the issue of of justice and so we recognize within the context of what the Word of God declares to us in this prophecy that God the Father was going to send his servant the Messiah so that he might do a couple of things and the primary thing that we recognize in the context of this passage is he's going to establish justice on the earth. And so my listening to the Constitution twice, excuse me, and then my reading it once brought me to a place of seeing this glorious parallel, if you will, between 
what Christ came to do as the Messiah of God, as the Anointed One of God. And what this passage of Scripture declares to us as well. And seeing that in the light of what the Constitution of the United States declares to us as well. Because you will remember that the essence of our democracy is found within the context of that constitution that was ratified by those early states. And there are two primary statements that are declared within the context of that constitution. You know them full well. But I remind you of them this morning. The first of which is that all men are created equal. And so the understanding of the founding fathers' idea of equality might be different than our understanding of democratic equality in these days as well. And certainly within the context of the Word of God, as we think about this idea of all men being created equal, we would recognize first and foremost that all men, women, boys, and girls are loved by God, right? And we would understand that they are loved by God when we read what John 3.16 declares to us. For God so loved the world, not this planet, but the people on this planet, that he sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And that even past that, he has entrusted the message of salvation to the body of Christ. And if we who have hope in Jesus Christ, do not operate within the context of that message and the declaration of that truth in the Word of God as it relates to everyone's needing to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Then you know what? Then the Bible declares, Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, To him or her who has been given much, much will be required. And so as we think about this idea of all men being created equally, we would understand that not only within the context of the Christian life would we see that in the love of God, but we would also recognize that every man, woman, boy, and girl is born in sin. David put in this way, In sin was I conceived. And you and I would understand that because of Adam's fall in the Garden of Eden, that every man, woman, boy, and girl that's been born after God created Adam and took a took a rib out of Adam and made Eve that mankind has been under and is still under the condemnation of sin. So yes, we are equal in the sense that God loves us and that God has provided through His justice a means whereby that love can be applied to our lives through the grace of God and the atoning work of Christ on Calvary and that our sins and our sin nature can be dealt with through the cross of Christ. And then we understand as well within the context of our Constitution that the second primary phrase mentioned there is that um, all men are endowed by their Creator. 
with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I would stand before you today and say that I do indeed believe that we have inalienable rights as people in this nation and as humankind. But I would also say that what the founding fathers were saying about a life not under oppression, the oppression of King George in England specifically, that we would understand this idea of life differently than they would have understood it at the beginning of this nation. For you and I who know Christ would understand that life is found in the word Zoe in the New Testament, Z-O-E. And that within the context of that word, we would understand that just as Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, Zoe, and that you might have it abundantly. So he's talking about a difference between true, genuine, God-given biblical life and mere existence on the planet. And so there are a lot of people, in fact, by 2023, I read this statistic this morning, by 2023, there will be eight billion with a B people on planet Earth. So in your lifetime and mine, we have seen the population of this planet grow about 5 billion people. It's hard to get your head around. And what we're seeing is that the church, the body of Christ, the people of God, are not necessarily moving on mission toward those additional 5 billion people who have been born since we've been here on the planet. But there's a difference between life in Christ and just the existence of life on planet Earth, correct? Because we sang about that just a few minutes ago. And we've come to a realization and a recognition based upon our involvement with the body of Christ and the Word of God that it is knowing Jesus that is without question the most important thing in your life and in mine. So our understanding of life is more than just mere existence in a country that we would consider to be free. And when we look at countries round about us, we would definitely come to the realization and the contention that we are free in this nation. So life and liberty. The word liberty literally means freedom. That they came from England to the United States so that they might be able to experience not only religious freedom, but civil freedom and governmental freedom as well. And that we here at Freedom Church would understand that freedom carries with it the idea that there is only freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. And without that freedom in Christ, people are under great, unceasing bondage. And so you and I have come to the place in our lives, I would hope, where we understand that there is no freedom other than that freedom that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that if we're going to make a difference in our nation and our world. And see, part of the deception of the enemy has been and continues to be that people believe that if they were born an American, that they're Christian because of the founding of this nation. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
there is no salvation apart from that which the Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross, having been applied to your life and to mine as well. And then that passage in the Constitution declares that we are having the opportunity to pursue happiness. And I believe that in this nation today, we would define happiness different than the Word of God would define happiness. Because in the Word of God, the term happiness is the term blessed. Right? And that there is far more than just tangible stuff. Because within the context of these United States, we would uh, equate the pursuit of happiness with having whatever we want. And that our happiness would be based upon that which we have tangibly. And we who know Christ would understand that that's not the case that it is significantly and entirely different than that. And only as we understand our blessing in Christ, only as we understand who we are in Him, will we genuinely and truly be blessed in all that we do. So go with me this morning to Isaiah chapter 42. And I want us to look this morning at the first nine verses. But let me, let me set forth for you. Oh, by the way, justice, the term justice is found three times in these nine verses. I want you to look for that word as I read this passage to us. Also, I want you to see what God, who is speaking here, is saying about his son and what he says about himself. And so this word declares to us some very significant things. So this is the definition of justice from the word of God that I want you to have. Justice is the order that God uses to reestablish His creation, whereby the establishment of this order, people receive the benefits of life in Him. So justice is the reestablishment of order from chaos. So recognizing, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, what you discover is that when man fell there in the Garden of Eden and was cast out of the garden, and that cherubim were stationed around that garden to keep man and woman out of that garden, it began a downward spiral of sin, whereby through that sin, chaos ruled. So within the context of God's justice, He has reestablished an order whereby we can see, understand, and be a part of those benefits of life in Him. And what we recognize is, is that justice is the primary moral code found in the Old Testament. So when you and I go to the Pentateuch, and we go to the book of Leviticus specifically, we understand that God gave the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, so that, what? We would have a picture, a precursor, if you will, a type might be another word we would use for that to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we look at the burnt offering in Leviticus chapter 2, we would understand that that offering was totally and completely given over to God. When we look at Christ on Calvary's cross, we recognize that He gave His life as a ransom for many. We recognize that He gave His life so that you and I might live in His Father through that work that He did for us on Calvary's cross. So we recognize that the justice of God 
is absolutely imperative for the restoration of creation. So as we think about that idea of justice and the nature of justice, we understand it is the standard by which penalties are applied. So someone who is outside of the realm of God, through the justice of God, penalties have been declared by God. Correct? The wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So God has established the parameters of what can and cannot be done based upon His justice. So justice is the standard not only of punishment, but of benefit as well. So when we get to Isaiah chapter 42, the first nine verses, we recognize that God is giving us here 750 years before the birth of His Son, our Savior, a picture of His grace. And this servant song picture in Isaiah chapter 42 declares to us that even we who are going to be grafted in according to the book of Romans, going to be grafted in to the true vine because we're wild vines that will be grafted in that God in His grace and God in His justice made a way so that you and I as Gentiles might receive the benefit of Almighty God. So let me read this to you. Notice it begins with the term behold. B-E-H-O-L-D. And what we see in that word is that God is directing Isaiah's readership and us as well to be aware of the facts that are being laid out here before us. So look what he says, beginning in verse 1. Behold, my servant God, my, his servant, the servant of God whom I, God says, uphold, my elect one, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles, blessing and curse, punishment and benefit. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not clench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands shall wait for his law. Verse 5, thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. Now, he's not speaking about us, nor is he speaking about Israel here but he's speaking about this servant whom he's already mentioned in the first four verses. And I will hold your hand, and I will keep you, and give you as a covenant to the people. So God, through his servant, the Messiah, is declaring that there will be a new covenant given through this one, who is God's servant. A covenant to the people. 
as a light to the Gentiles. You and I should be so grateful for God's grace in our lives that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins so that we might be come the people of God. Now look at verse 7, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to anyone, give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and a new thing, God says, I declare. If you write in your Bible, I would encourage you to underline that, that phrase there in verse 9. A new thing I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So within the context of this, you can see the outline there on the screen behind me. That What, I, what I'd like to do is to walk us through what this passage says to us. And we find out initially what Yahweh, the covenant God, says about himself. Now, my question to you, as it relates to that, and as it relates to those verses 5, 6, and verse 8, where we have Yahweh, the covenant God, speaking about himself, is why, why in fact would God choose to say what he says to us here in Isaiah chapter 42. So look at, look at the passage with me. Look at verse 5. Look what he says. Thus says God the Lord. The declaration of his covenant is there in the word Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. So then he talks about being the creator God, does he not? Look what he, who created the heavens and stretched them out. Who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it. And then he goes on to say, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. So why, why would God talk about not only his covenant, but the act and process of creation as he begins to talk about the one who is coming to be the Messiah. Well, a couple of reasons. First and foremost of all, we see God establishing his position. His position as the God of covenant. He is declaring in this passage that he is God, the God of covenant, and that he's made covenant with the children of Israel, and that now he is speaking to us 750 years before the coming of Christ that this covenant under this Messiah, under this shepherd, will be greater than the covenant that was declared under the law of Moses. So he talks about there not only being the covenant God, but being the creator. So he is establishing his authority not only over the Jews, but over all mankind. Because the end of that verse declares to us that it was he who gave life to these dead bones. It is he who put breath in your life and into your body and mine. And that we need to recognize his sovereign position over all the earth. So only as we understand his sovereign position will we be able to understand the rationale for his justice, both blessings and punishment on this earth. Look what it says, look what else it says in verse 6. I, the Lord, God, have called you, called his servant in righteousness. He has called his servant in rightness, in that which is righteous. 
And we know that if there is going to be one who is able to bring salvation to mankind, he must be 100% man. But we also recognize that Jesus was not born with a sin nature. And because he did not have a sin nature, we understand that he was able to be the sinless lamb, the lamb without spot and without blemish. And he did nothing, no thing in his life did he do that was not associated completely with what God wanted him to do. So when we sing that song about Jesus being our example this morning, we understand that that's what we're striving for. We're looking to get to a place where we understand that we to recognize that God is in control of our lives. He's sovereign of the universe. He is sovereign over you and me and over this body and over this town and over this county. And as such, He is in control and in charge. And then we recognize that because He is in control and in charge, we then, like Christ, are seeking to do what He tells us to do, not what we desire to do, not what we think we ought to do, but what He declares to us. So look at verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give another, nor my praise to carved image. So He is making a clear distinction here between the gods, small g, of the Canaanites, the Baals, and the Ashtoreth, and all of those other gods that the nations round about Israel had, and that he is declaring himself to be above all of those so-called gods who are just carved images. So he is declaring his position over mankind. He is declaring his position over creation. He is declaring his position of being the one who sent the anointed one, the Messiah, to this earth. You remember, it was the will of the Father that sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So let's just talk for a minute this morning about the will of God. Let's just talk about God's will in your life and mine. If God is sovereign over the universe, and He is, and He is the God of covenant, and He is, then what does that mean about your life and mine? If God's in control, and He is, then how are we to respond to Him? Well, there are lots of ways people respond to God. Some people respond to God in rebellion. They respond to the grace of God with, I'm going to do whatever I want to do when I want to do it, and nobody can tell me not to. And you know what? God's a gentleman. No, he's greater than a gentleman, but, but you, you see the, the picture here. He's not going to force anything on anyone because His desire is that we choose by a definitive act of our will to do what He's called us to do. So people respond negatively, right? Well, we all know people who are living their own lives. They, uh, they said they had a, a salvific experience 
you know, 50 years ago when there's never been in their life even a small picture of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And I think we have to recognize that those people are probably lost. Because if there was not a metamorphosis, that word transformation that we've talked about time and time again here, if the caterpillar hadn't become a butterfly, right? That's the picture. Then there's not been the kind of change that is necessary to save someone from their sins. You see, we've kind of got in this nation this idea that salvation is just optional. It's just something we add on. And yet salvation, the coming to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, is the beginning of, the front door of, our living a life in obedience to Christ. So we can respond negatively and do things our way and hope, perhaps, that on my deathbed, God will extend His grace to me one more time and I'll have the opportunity to get saved just before I die. Or we can respond positively to the message of Christ. And when we respond positively to the message of Christ, that means we recognize that Jesus Christ died only for us. Now, I'm not saying that to be uh, exclusive. What I'm saying that to be is all of us must come to the place in our lives where we understand that, yes, he died for the sin of the world, but, but even more than that, he died for you and me. And if we were the only people who had ever been born, he would have died just for us. And so we come to a place of understanding that Christ died in our place. He suffered in your stead and mine. And he gave his life so that you and I could be redeemed. And so we can respond positively and recognize that through his redemption, through that declaration of redemption that he has made possible for us, that we can become children of God. We can become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And so in essence, what happens is that when we come to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, Jesus becomes our big brother with a purpose who gives us, within the context of the gospel specifically, a picture of how we need to live our lives. And so there's this glorious transformation that takes place. And then we receive baptism. You know why we, we, we baptize people? Not only because it's an ordinance of the church, but because God wants us to declare through baptism our allegiance to Him. And that we, through baptism, are putting off that old life and putting on that new life. Now, we've already become new creatures in Christ Jesus even if we don't go through the waters of baptism. But when we do go through the waters of baptism, we are declaring with our testimony that we're children of God, that we have been changed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we now want to be identified as part of the body of Christ. And so then becoming identified with the body of Christ means that we are now in a position where we're no longer in charge. And we have freedom in Christ because He's in charge of everything. And we live our lives in absolute obedience. Now, we know we're going to fall. We understand that we're not perfect beings. We'll never be perfect in this body. But we should be better today than we were yesterday. We should be better tomorrow than we were today. We should know more about Jesus today than we did yesterday. Know about Jesus more tomorrow than we know about him today. 
And so we begin to be different and live out that different difference in a world of confusion and sin. And we stand out as the body of Christ because of who Jesus is in us. I'm going to pray, and we're going to have a, a hymn of invitation. Now, as it relates to an invitation today, here's what I would say to you. That first of all, it, you need to settle the issue of salvation. Do you know Jesus? And if you can settle that issue, then the next issue becomes one of, okay, if I'm a believer, what's he telling me to do? What is my role within the context of the body? What does he expect me to do? And how does that fit into what he expects us to do here in this local body of believers? And that then we begin to live that out. So, so what I would say to you is that the invitation is about meeting God face to face in a new and profound way and just making sure that you're where you need to be with him and that you're comfortable and that God's comfortable with you as well. And if you're outside the family of God today, let me just say to you, Jesus loves you, Jesus died for you, you're a sinner, you need to be saved, and that God is in the saving business, and that today is the day of salvation. And that you can't be saved unless God draws you. And that God is in that drawing business as well. And that you need to be transformed and changed. Let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you this morning. We thank you for your blessed holy word. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you here in this place. We thank you that you care so much for us and that you continue to extend your grace to us in glorious, sundry ways. Father, I pray this morning as we encounter you in the context of this invitation, that you would just have your will and your way and that you would be glorified here in this place. Lead us this morning, each individually, so that we might do exactly what you want us to do, to do exactly what you want us to do, so that you might be in charge of all things. In Jesus' name and for his sake I pray, amen. of the last two and a half months since my brother had his uh, massive heart attack and, uh, and by the grace of God 
uh, he, was, uh, he was saved from being killed in the midst of all that, that I have walked every morning since then. And I've lost 15 pounds, and I'm grateful for that as well. But this morning as I was walking, and it was a little bit later this morning because I went to bed later than normal last night, that um, where I walk, there's a, there's a pond not too far off the road that I, that I walk on. And this morning there was a, a beautiful little four-point buck deer standing right next to that pond drinking as much water as he could get in his mouth and in his body. And he drank and drank and drank. And finally, he looked up at me and recognized me as not being a threat, I suspect, and went back to drinking again. And I think what needs to happen in your life and in mine, that we need to recognize that God is our strength and our shield. And that just like the deer panteth for the water, that we long for God. What are you longing for in these days? We need the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have any birthdays today. Is there an announcement that needs to be made before we uh, depart? Wow, I turned all the way around. <laughs> Anything? Well, amen. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Chad, pray for us.